Welcome everyone to the August session of Flower Monthly. Today is 7th of August. It has been already one month since the last uh, Flower Monthly, and that's why we have a big list of updates to, to share with you from the Flower team. And also we're going to hear about two amazing pieces of research from uh, two researchers that are joining us today. So the agenda for today is uh, as follow. We usually follow the same structure. Is this welcome message, which is what we, is happening now. Then we'll go into a short but quite uh, packed uh, list of updates from Flower, what we have been up to in the month of July. And then we'll hear first from uh, Faris Gill. He's from Virginia Tech, and he will be telling us about debugging and interpretability in federated learning systems and why it is a critical uh, topic to be able to do uh, correctly and effectively. And then we'll hear from our second uh, set of speakers. They are Sharia and Manimaran, and they are joining us from the Iowa State University. And they will be telling us about their la latest research on federated learning for anomaly detection in charging electric vehicles. So without further ado, uh, let's jump into the Flower update. So the first item in the Flower update that probably you have heard about already if you have been uh, in the Flower Slack for the last few weeks or even checking our posts in social media is that we have released a super exciting two-part course with Deep Learning.ai. As you probably are aware, Deep Learning.ai is this amazing learning platform uh, uh, that is being led by Andrew Eng. So we partner with him to develop these two courses. The first part of the course is about introduction to federated learning. Highly likely that many of you are already familiar with most, but maybe not all the concepts that are being taught in that part of the course, or maybe you have you want to bring other people into the federated learning ecosystem. So I think this first part, this part one course is an amazing material to learn everything about federated learning. And the second part is more advanced. It's about taking up a, a large language model and learn how you can federate the fine tuning of this model in a privacy preserving way. And this is done uh, with some medical uh, data sets, which is a simplified but quite complete, complete uh, set of notebooks that allow you to learn how to do this in a in a learning, learning environment, because everything is done in Cola, but you can very easily take this and implement it in a more realistic setup when you do some other prototypes. Um, the course is using a fairly small LLM for the notebooks, but you also have the chance to play around with a 7 billion LLM that we have trained uh, for this course. Um, more on this, I can share some ideas more uh, later. What else? Um, the next other big piece of news is that the release of Flower 1.10. In particular, there are quite a few updates packed here. Some of them are in a beta mode, others are ready to be used. One that, are, uh, that I am very excited about is this Flower Run uh, command that we have integrated into Flower. The, the short summary of what Flower Run is, is that with Flower Run, you will be able to run pretty much any, any federated learning project built on Flower. To make it uh, fully versatile, there is a run config system also integrated. So you no longer need to have a third party config, config file system to allow you to, to, to modify the behavior of your code at runtime. Configs are built in now in Flower. This config file system one of, is one of the things that we use through something we call the context. And now, if, if you have been using Flower for a while, you know that when you want to create your client app, usually you do it through a client function. So now the signature of that client function has changed. Instead of having the, the client ID, which was a string before, now it has the context, which is a data structure that makes everything much more versatile. And through the context, you can pass the config file to your clients very easily. 
we have introduced an equivalent uh, functionality to the server side. So now you can get your server apps through a function called server function, for example, and it allows you also to read the config. There is, as you know, there is a, a command that has been there for some time called flower new. Flower new, if you have an environment with flower and you type flower new in the terminal, it will walk you through a process in an interactive way. Uh, and the output of this will be a fully working project with flower with their client app, the server app, and everything you need to have a simple but functional uh, Flower application that now you can run directly with Flower Run without any changes to the code whatsoever. There are quite a few templates. There are templates for PyTorch, TensorFlow, JAX, Transformers, and many more. And we are actively updating those so they have even more functionality. So make sure that make sure to give it a try to Flower New and later to Flower Run. All this has been possible with a substantial amount of improvements and updates to the simulation engine and the deployment engine. And you can read more about them in the blog post that we put together for this release. This blog post that you can find on our website has all the details about what's new in Flower 1.10. And if you want to uh, give it a try to this, to this uh, Flower Run command uh, directly, uh, you can already try this with the updated examples. In particular, the Quick Start PyTorch, TensorFlow, FestAI, and MLX, and others have been updated already. If you go to the GitHub repo and check them, you will see they have all a unified uh, readme. They all have the same structure. They can all be executed in a pretty much identical way. So the idea we have with this is to lower the barrier of switching from one type of Flower project to another. So I'm really excited about this, and we'll have many more things to share in the next Flower Monthly. Another big update has been Flower datasets. Um, we are making a lot of progress in this front. And one of our data scientists, Adam, who was the author of this blog post, has been really making a huge improvement to the library in recent months. This, big, this update has two new partitioners, pathological and distributed distribution partition, that extend the family of partitioners that are already supported. Now there are over 12 partitioners supported. There are built-in support for tests for many data sets you are familiar with, and also the documentation has been updated. So you can test all the test features very conveniently in, in Colab, for example. Another big update that maybe you saw some of posts, some posts on LinkedIn has to do with the Flower LLM project. So Flower LLM is the world's first 3 billion parameter model that has been pre-trained exclusively uh, through federated learning using Flower. This is a, a big deal. And we have, um, we have re released all the details about this project in two papers that you can find here the links to archive. They are also under review in, in some of the best machine learning conference uh, currently. And it has been a collaboration, collaboration between the Flower team and the University of Cambridge. We didn't stop there, just releasing the papers and other details about the Flower LLM project, but we also have put together a series of videos that you can find linked in our LinkedIn that tells you all the details starting from uh, the high level concept all the way to the more technical details. They are presented in a series of videos. Two of the videos are, in two of the videos, are with the authors, the lead authors of this work are joining, uh, Nick. They are Lorenzo Sania, and Alex Jacob. They are two PhD students in the University of Cambridge that have built most of the components in the Flower LLM project. Finally, uh, just as a quick update, later this month, uh, myself and some of our members are going to be in Barcelona to join the KDD conference. We are going to be giving a hands-on workshop, three-hour workshop, about uh, privacy preserving federated learning. So if you're attending KDD, uh, you're very welcome to say, to say hi or even to stay the, during the whole workshop. 
But if you're not in KDD and you're in Barcelona, probably we'll be doing some small event that you all can join. So stay tuned for that. Finally, and I'm finishing with the updates. There are some small updates regarding some Slack channels in our uh, Flower workspace on Slack. The news channel, and uh, we are revamping the channel, and now every day there will be a piece of news uh, being posted relevant to federated learning or to Flower. So make, make sure you join the channel if you want to be up to date with the latest uh, news about federated learning. And then we have a Flower LLM channel that you can join if you want to ask questions about the Flower LLM project. And similarly, there is this course deep learning of AI channel that you can join to ask questions about the deep learning of AI course. So feel free to join those if you have, if you are interested in, doing, in these projects or initiatives. Okay, so these are all the updates I wanted to share about uh, Flower. So without further ado, let's jump into the amazing talks from our speakers. I think we can start with the talk from Varys Jill. He's, he comes from Virginia Tech. And he's going to tell us about his work titled Achieving Debugging and Interpretability in Federated Learning Systems. So Varys, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. And the floor is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. And thank you, Javi. Uh, I'm Waris Gill. I am a third year PhD student at Virginia Tech. And uh, today I will present our recent research on debugging and interpretability in federated learning system. And uh, these presented techniques are built in Flower and we will uh, soon, uh, th these will be available in Flower AI base files. So as we all know in federated learning, uh, clients participate to train a global model. Uh, uh, in series of steps and uh, training usually uh, continues for multiple rounds and real world examples are Siri, Alexa, Google Gboard. And uh, the main benefit of federated learning is uh, we can train a high quality AI model without accessing clients' private data. Uh, and the debugging problem in federated learning, it, it's uh, it, it actually quite hard. So suppose that Bob's model becomes faulty during its local training. And uh, a faulty client can be due to basically a natural reason, for instance, a faulty sensor or camera or malicious reason, for instance, backdoor attacks or data poisoning attacks. Uh, now during aggregation, uh, uh, the Bob's model will also make the global model faulty. Basically, it, it, it will inject the backdoor or uh, it, it will reduce the accuracy of the global model. Another question is how an FL developer automatically finds a, a, such a faulty client? So the trivial solution is basically to access the client's data and uh, to evaluate each model uh, to find the faulty client. Uh, however, in federated learning, uh, the access to client's data is, is forbidden. We cannot access the client's data to evaluate, uh, 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 basically to for the testing and uh, debugging purposes. As it put, uh, as uh, I mean, due to privacy reasons and also it put burden on the clients. Another question is how uh, we can determine um, a Bob uh, is a faulty client without accessing client's data or putting a burden on the clients. Uh, our contribution basically is based on two uh, modules, interactive debugging and uh, fault localization in our paper fed debug. So uh, it's in interactive debugging an FL developer can interact with the live FL application without uh, pausing it. And the fault localization module assists the developer to automatically find the Bob, uh, which is a faulty client in our case. And now I will explain how uh, the working of interactive debugging module of a debug. So suppose that uh, a breakpoint is placed at, let's say, at round 19 uh, uh, for the inspection. And after the breakpoint, Fed debug launches an interactive debugging, uh, which is the live simulation of FL training. Note that the, uh, the, the client's training continues in the background, background uninterrupted, uh, while the developer is interacting uh, with the live simulation to avoid pausing the entire distributive training. And in interactive debugging, the developer can inspect any training ground, basically. For instance, uh, the, uh, the, uh, 
step next take the developer to let's say around 20 and step the step in takes to inspect the individual clients and no suppose the bob is a faulty client and uh, uh, it uh, uses uh, the fed debug basically uses fault localization technique uh, to find that the bob is a faulty client and ignore its contribution during the aggregation uh, from this round onwards let's say and step out basically take uh, so basically uh, the the, uh, the the this will take out the uh, from the from the round to uh, from the client level to the round level and after resume uh, the training continues and if there is no faulty client fed debug will have nearly no impact on the live fl training so to enable uh, interactive debugging and fault localization fed debug only stores uh, client models uh, 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 client model reporter metrics such as round IDs, hyperparameters, uh, in order to uh, in order to reproduce uh, the a faulty state. And uh, the key key insight is that Fed, Fed debug does not instrument anything on the client side, and it does not require access to any kind of private data. Now let's discuss how Fed debug localizes the faulty clients at the central server. Uh, here is a quick, quick overview of a backdoor attack, which we can think uh, as a faulty client in case of predatory learning. So without a trigger pattern, the self-driving uh, car will stop at the stop sign. However, it will accelerate when it's, uh, it sees a trigger pattern, which in this case uh, is a sticky note uh, pasted on the stop sign. To find a faulty uh, fault in, in, let's say, in software engineering, we require usually two things, uh, test input and test oracle. For instance, to test a neural network, we uh, we require an image and its corresponding label, which in this case, uh, uh, the, uh, a developer sitting at the center server does not have access to uh, the real world inputs or the client inputs and, and the corresponding data. And due to this, the existing um, uh, uh, ML testing and debugging solutions are inapplicable in predatory learning. So the one quick solution is to generate random inputs at the central server and test the neural network, basically the global model. However, it's impossible to assign a real label to a random input because each, each client may produce a different output uh, on, on a randomly generated input at the central server. So, so our solution was basically to uh, apply, uh, apply differential execution uh, on the neuron activations which are activated on the given random input. So just to give the quick overview of uh, differential execution, it's in differential execution, we have, uh, let's say, multiple versions of the same program and we compare their output uh, on the same, same test input. For instance, in this case, uh, we, uh, on the same test input uh, program, we want to produce output three, and the program V3 produce output uh, also three, but the uh, but, but the second program uh, it's a, it's a, its output is forty, which is basically uh, anomalous, or you can say it has an error. So th that's where this program might have a bug, and it can be done at different level output comparison, bytecode comparison, crashing comparison. Similarly to this, we did uh, basically we compare the entire. Uh, uh, so we have a random input. Uh, and our insight was basically the all the neural networks, uh, basically all the clients in the federal link will share the same uh, same architecture or uh, similar neural network. So their internal behavior should be comparable. So what we did, we feed the random input to each client, uh, and we capture their uh, neuron activations, and uh, and the one which uh, have uh, different neurons, uh, uh, different set of neuron activation is basically a faulty client. So, for instance, in this case, on this particular random input, uh, the Alice has, let's say, N1, N2, N3, and N5 are activated, and it's very similar to uh, Charlie, but with the Bob, it's uh, N1, N4, and N5 neurons are triggered. So, from this one, we can say that the Bob uh, might be a faulty client. Uh, in federal and uh, in the context of in the in, in the given round so uh, yeah so bob contains a backdoor attack 
or or it's a data poisoning attack or some, due to some other error it, it can be a faulty client and uh, yeah so here is uh, the use case of uh, fat debug which uh, we presented in fat defender which uh, basically detect the backdoor attacks in predatory learning and it can be integrated with any uh, any existing uh, aggregating algorithm such as fat average fat data or fat prox and we can see that uh, it basically reduced the attack success rate to uh, 10%, which is basically we can count it as a zero, and it it successfully mitigate the backdoor attacks in predatory learning without uh, basically requiring any uh, by just comparing the internal uh, neuron activations uh, of, of the client models. So here are some of the limitations of uh, Fat Debug. Uh, it basically really works well in IID settings, but it may yield low accuracy in non-IID settings. And uh, if test data, let's say, is available at the central server, it doesn't utilize it fully. And uh, it's uh, mainly limited to image classification purposes, and uh, we didn't test it on transformer architecture. So next, I will talk about interpretability and uh, explainability in federated learning systems. And uh, so suppose we have uh, 10 hospitals uh, which are uh, uh, which are part participating in FL training uh, to to uh, for me for medical image classification. Uh, now suppose FL global model makes a prediction on a medical uh, image related to a cancer diagnosis, which uh, so now the question is which hospital is mainly responsible for the uh, for this particular prediction, for instance, we have a cancer input and mucus input, and the 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 global model correctly uh, classify uh, classify these uh, these inputs uh, during production or during, at the at testing time. So we want to debug or we want to see which clients is uh, or which hospital is basically responsible for this particular prediction. As we can see, for instance, in this case, a hospital seven. Hospital six and hospital five have uh, have labels uh, related to cancer, but the other hospital doesn't have any uh, any any label to uh, any 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 label related to cancer. So in in this uh, in this in this scenario, and this is a real world example, and we trained this neural network on uh, uh, I think a colon path patholo pathology data set. And sorry, so here is the output of the TraceFL, which basically uh, used neuron provenance technique, which we presented in uh, in TraceFL, uh, which actually given a prediction or the given the output of a global model, it traces back the responsible client in the in the federated learning, and it ranks basically all the clients which are participating in the given round uh, 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 based on their participation. So in this case. On on the cancer input, the hospital six is the most responsible hospital as uh, it has the data label. For instance, in this case, H H seven has the data label, and it was it has the most number of data labels uh, 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 related to cancer input. So so the, the, that's why it's ranked higher. And similarly, it it gives a probability distribution across all the clients which are participating in the given round to uh, to, uh, to determine. Uh, the most influential client uh, 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 for for the given prediction, and uh, uh, yeah, so this is a high level overview of our in uh, of our work uh, related to interpretability in federated learning, and this was uh, uh, yeah. So we recently uh, it's under submission, and we will make it. Uh, we will put it on archive, and I will soon share the uh, share the links. And here are the some of the results of TraceFL, and we trained, we used it with GPT, and uh, 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 basically we trained it on six uh, six different data sets, and including to real world medical imaging data sets and four uh, neural net ar architectures, uh, ResNet, DenseNet, GPT, and BERT, and uh, it performs really well across all different uh, data sets and domains. And it's fully compatible with any classification model such as GPT uh, from and uh, and you can train basically any 
uh, neural network from Hugging Face in in Flower Framework, and you can use TraceFL to basically see which client is responsible for the given behavior of the uh, of the uh, global model, and uh, it's also supports Flower datasets and uh, differential privacy. Uh, future work basically we will it's not uh, currently these frameworks doesn't support uh, non parametric models such as random forest and uh, we want to also basically integrate the text generation tasks uh, to to interpret like what clients uh, which client is basically responsible for the given uh, output of let's say a gpt we, if we train it in flower and we want to see uh, the 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 influence of individual clients on the output of the global model, and uh, it's also we wa also want to support regression tasks and predictive learning uh, uh, tasks in in our current uh, frameworks. And uh, here is the uh, you, you can check these works now. And uh, if you have any question, please uh, feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you, Boris, for the super interesting talk. I I. I was not expecting to hear about TraceFL, and I think that's really interesting work as well. And I have questions also about, uh, less about TraceFL, but I have more about FedDebug. Uh, so I can start asking sure. some questions. If any of sure. you in the audience remember, you can write a message, and I will be I will be able to see it, and I can ask a question on your behalf. So my first question, which I was a bit confused at the beginning, is what do you mean? So my understanding is when you say faulty client, you is like a very general term. You all, you, but you mostly refer to malicious client, right? Uh, yeah, we can say it's a malicious client, basically. Uh, uh, and a malicious client can be due to uh, a faulty sensor or due to some uh, human error during the data labeling. And okay. so we train incorrect model basically. So it's a it's a uh, its output is not correct. Or let's say it, it contains partially. Uh, let's say it, there was an issue with the data labeling, and half of the labels were correct, and half of the labels were incorrect. And there, so so we, uh, if we test this model, uh, individual client model, it will let's say it will produce an accuracy of let's say fifty percent. Uh, yeah. But the rest of the 20% is due to some mislabeling or some some stuff, okay. uh, or it, it may be injecting a backdoor attack. So in this in this kind of scenario, if we use Fed debug like differential execution, so it will it will try to localize that this client is most uh, it, it might be uh, uh, might be a faulty client because we do not want to say it is a malicious client because yeah. in malicious client. Uh, th there is some malicious intent, but it can be due to an human error. Yeah. Okay, yeah. interesting. Okay, uh, one question I had when you were I found it very interesting in the part you were saying that uh, FL process is going, and then you can interactively you can interact with the process. And I just wrote just a couple of notes just to make sure I understood it correctly. So the idea would yeah. be uh, the rounds happen, and at some point the developer says, "Okay, let me put a breakpoint." And what will happen is like there will be some kind of forking happening. FL continues as yes. normal. But then what you can, yeah. as a developer can interact with is with, a, for example, in Flower, the strategy, and you can inspect all the results that you will be receiving from, in this case, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. And then you interactively can say, oh, Bob, Bob's result seems to be really totally unexpected. Yeah. So th therefore, yeah. now that I'm going to finish this interactive session, I'm gonna uh, blacklist Bob from the remaining of the federation. Is that a typical? Yes. Way yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Mm. And you can basically plug in any fault localization technique. So it's a, so this part is totally independent of uh, uh, the differential execution part. So yeah. you can have any other uh, fault localization technique. Even you can run trace FL uh, with Fed debug. So this is uh, basically uh, we designed it this way. And basically, the, uh, for instance, if you put a breakpoint and there was no fault, uh, so the training will continue. And if you let say you didn't find, so everything seems normal. So if you hit, okay, let's continue. 
uh, then the uh, it doesn't pass actually the, it it doesn't pass the background so so the training continues in the background basically so it doesn't pass actual federated learning training so basically you can inspect as many round as you want but at the if you let's say if you if if you want to fix something then it will resume from that round basically let's say uh, uh, you you placed a break point at 19 and you were inspecting it let's say and the training continues to let's say round 30 but you didn't find any fault let's say in round 20 or any of the round so it will automatically start from round 30 so it doesn't pass the system at that point okay but yeah. I, I, there are a couple of questions from someone in the audience the question is in fed debug is the fault is the fault decline going to be removed and not get selected once it is found. I guess this is relevant to the comment I made about if I found an error, it will be blacklisted, for example. Yeah, I, yes, it, it will be removed. removed. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. So it, it actually, actually also, I think we didn't make it strict that we, you cannot, let's say, if it, it was a, if, if it was a error, let's say human error, then it definitely can uh, uh, continue uh, in the in the next round. Basically, yes. it, it can participate if, if if it can fix it. But if, uh, for instance, if it's a, uh, if it cannot fix it, or if you seem if it seems malicious, then you can say, okay, it, this client should never participate in the future FL training rounds. Yeah, Good. yeah, makes sense. Yeah, so I guess there will be additional mechanisms needed to kind of like identify, like maybe authenticate with clients, and then say, okay, this has. This client has authenticated, but there is a faulty. I'm not going to let it authenticate and connect again anymore. So, yeah, but that's a bit orthogonal, but that's one way that could work. Okay. Um, while we wait for other questions, I have one question. Uh, in the one of the last plots, you were showing the results. You were showing how the accuracy goes up, but then there, I saw the red line that going not previous yet. The the Previous in this one back, not in fed debug. In fed debug, okay. Yeah, that red line on the left, like going up and down. And can you explain a bit? Because the accuracy, I understand, uh, is going up, but then. Yes. So in this case, uh, so this is the model classification accuracy, and this is a attack success rate. So this is non non clipping defense. Usually, people used for. Uh, 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 for the defense related to backdoor attacks or. Uh, so, so we compare basically uh, uh, the uh, the Fed debug with the non clipping defense. So we can see, for instance, in this round the backdoor was injected, but in this round the backdoor was not injected, and the attack success rate was zero. So this is and but in in the case of Fed debug, it continuously it doesn't select that particular. It, it removes that client basically, and in this in this one in in non clipping defense, the client is not removed. So it basically it reduces its impact uh, yeah, on the global model, yeah. but uh, in some rounds we can see its impact. But in case of uh, if you see with the uh, uh, with the Fed debug, it uh, reduces its uh, impact to nearly to zero. And the good thing about this approach is uh, you can integrate it with any um, any federated uh, le uh, learning algorithm. Let's say Fed average Fed. Fed procs, anything because it doesn't it doesn't depend on any uh, underlying algorithm because people propose sometimes different algorithms to mitigate such kind of behavior in Fed learning uh, yeah. and they uh, they uh, they propose uh, 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 new techniques uh, which yeah. uh, uh, which uh, where they need to basically change Fed average uh, the functionality of Fed average yeah so in this case you can just plug in. And it will work, and it will automatically localize uh, this uh, this client. I think it's an interesting approach. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Okay, I think before we jump to the next uh, talk, I I have a couple of questions about RaceFL. I think it was super interesting. I'm really looking forward to read the paper uh, yeah. at some point. Uh, my question is: So you were saying that from a prediction that my global model can do. What trace affair allows me to to get a like a some probability of uh, how much of this prediction the global model 
output yeah. so where it is more likely coming from or something uh, so, so in this case, so as we know in federated learning, uh, the global model is not directly trained on any kind of data, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so if it makes a prediction, so there will be some client responsible for that particular prediction, right? Because uh, that okay, client very will, many yeah. clients will be partially. Yeah. Responsible. Yeah. 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 So partially responsible. So we want to see, uh, let's say how much, uh, let's say you want to assign some reward based on the prediction, okay. or you want to you want to give some uh, benefit or let's say uh, any kind of basically benefit. So, or you want to, to include that particular uh, client uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, more number of times in the, in the future rounds, or you want to give a higher weightage to such a client, because for instance, in this case, cancer, uh, so detecting a cancer related to uh, fr from the medical, MGs is is a very important task. So we we want to give some higher weight to such hospitals which have uh, which can basically have the ability to uh, correctly classify uh, the medical uh, uh, these uh, basically okay. the, these uh, these inputs. So what Traceable does it ranks the clients based on probability distribution that it's uh, uh, the hospital to. Uh, is the 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 responsible client, uh, or, or we can say, is the most responsible client for this particular prediction, which in this case is mucus. So on this on this input, it predicts this, and this is the output distribution of this test. It says that uh, with uh, thirty four percent probability, that hospital two is uh, is the uh, is the responsible client in this case uh, for this particular prediction. And then it says hospital four, hospital three. So it's basically ranks all those hospitals, uh, uh, which uh, uh, which constitute basically to form this uh, global model. So so which uh, uh, so so yeah, what it does it's in the background it used neuron provenance. So what we did we uh, for uh, so we know that uh, during uh, during a prediction. A set of neurons participate in the prediction. So what we did, we trace back the origin of that particular neuron, neuron back towards the, their client. So we see in this particular neuron, this client has contributed this much, and from that we can uh, we contributed all these uh, scores. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so oh. and yeah, and we recently. Uh, uh, so, so the old version is already up on archive, but this okay. is the most recent version. And we submitted it on uh, recently, so I will share it uh, in the in the Slack uh, in in Flower in Flower Slack channel. And also, this is the most uh, th this end to end is completely uh, uh, th this technique TraceFL is already implemented in Flower, uh, but it's not according to the Flower baselines. So I, I will try to yeah <laughs> I will convert it to the baseline and then I will share. Okay, so uh, okay. and. Uh, and I use the, uh, the recent uh, development from uh, Flower. So I use Flower data sets, which was very cool. Nice. And yeah. because, it, yeah, it, uh, it uh, and even for instance, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, these data, medical data sets were not supported in, in, in the Flower data sets. Right. So, but there was a, but there was a documentation uh, that explains how we can integrate our new data sets. Yeah. So I did this and it actually works perfectly fine without any issue. Right. And it, 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 it's, it's quite amazing. And I also use the differential privacy in, in, uh, uh, from Fl Flower uh, in simulation, because I think if I remember correctly, the previous simulation version of the Flower uh, doesn't support uh, the differential privacy or you have to do a lot of changes, but recently you just need to, I think, just add one line with the uh, server engine or I forget the, yeah, code, server but app, yeah, yeah, server, a uh, server app and client app. Yeah, so with with yes. that, it's 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 very easy to integrate the dif differential okay. privacy, and uh, I developed all these uh, things on Hugging Face. Basically, I use their training loop to train GPT, BERT, these kind of models. So you can basically take any transformer model and you can train it in federated learning, and nice. you can have uh, 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 you can you can see they are basically rank the clients uh, using traceful based on their participation. Yeah, I think and, it's, yeah it's very cool. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to, to check it out when you when you are ready to share it. Uh, of course, super welcome to be a flower baseline. I think this will be 
really, really interesting for a lot of people, especially because you know yeah. when you can visualize where this prediction comes from, I think that opens so many more doors for uh, ideas and learning. And I, I think there are a lot of questions about privacy, but you were using DP, so that, that that is quite an amazing project, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. But in DP, I was uh, confused. For instance, let's say if if I am saying if Trace FL saying uh, that this uh, particular input is related to this particular hospital. So essentially, we are not trying to recover any kind of data. We are just saying because this this information is public already public that hospitals will have data related to some medical diseases. So if we predict a label towards a specific hospital, I think it doesn't violate the differential privacy or stuff like that, but that is not my expertise, but I use the uh, uh, the, uh, the differential privacy, which uh, was, uh, which I see in Flower AI. Yeah, uh, so sense. I use I mean, those parameters, yeah. I think those things, I think it's like a great scale, like uh, how private it has to be. I think depends on the application and the context. So. You know, maybe this is knowing where this prediction for this particular patient has gotten yeah. the most and influence from. Maybe it's not bad, but I think everything is like the, the complete context. And yes, and you can also use TraceFL basically to tighten the differential privacy. So let's say if it's correctly predicting a specific label to a specific client, so you can increase the noise or the other sensitivity parameter in yeah, in differential exactly. privacy to to yeah so you can use it as as a guy as a guide to basically tune the differential privacy so yeah perfect i mean looking forward to learn more when you have it sharing the slack uh sure now we should move to our next talk uh, thank you very much again for the amazing talk and uh, for thank the you. two exciting pieces of work you have been doing during your phd Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So this second talk is titled FLEVCS, which is going to be about federated learning based anomaly detection for EV charging ecosystems. I think this is a very relevant topic. EV charging and knowing how to do with, with FL, something that I didn't see coming, but I'm really excited to, to learn more about it. OK. So good. the floor is yours. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever part of the world you are attending this out, uh, this session today. So today I'll be presenting our work uh, uh, on FLEVCS, the Federated Learning Based Anomaly Detection for EV Charging Ecosystem. So just before the uh, diving into this presentation, I just want to quote something out. Uh, as our friend, uh, friendly neighborhood superhero once said that with great powers come great responsibility. So I think this wisdom perfectly applies to the realm of uh, EV charging uh, station cybersecurity going forward for sure. So just quickly giving a introduction about me and uh, my major professor. So I'm Shorpret. I'm a PhD candidate uh, in electrical and computer engineering at Iowa State University. Uh, my major focuses on secure and reliable computing and uh, my research uh, endeavors around the development of cybersecurity solutions, particularly uh, pioneering uh, anomaly and intrusion detection system for various use cases using uh, tools like machine learning, neural networks, federated learning and game theory and uh, my professor uh, Dr. Maniman Govind Rasu is currently a, a distinguished professor at uh, the electrical and computer engineering at Iowa State University. His uh, research includes basically cybersecurity for smart grids and critical infrastructures, IoT security and real-time systems. Uh, he has authored more than uh, 250 peer uh, research publications received multiple best paper awards and uh, given several dozen talks and tutorials on the cyber security training sessions and uh, the major effort he has put into to build the ISU cyber security testbed for the smart grid and uh, successfully has collaborated with many universities, national laboratories and industries in their R&D projects as well. 
So uh, this is the agenda for the presentation today. I'll be giving a brief introduction about the side physical systems and the EV charging and why this problem basically uh, needs to be addressed. Then a little bit about the EV charging stations architecture, then some prior related work and uh, what the research objective is, followed by uh, our methodology for the federated learning anomaly detection system, followed by the performance evaluation and summary and future work of our work. So, uh, just giving a brief introduction uh, before deep diving into the EV charging station. So, what exactly are these uh, like systems? So, these are like cyber physical systems. Uh, these basically integrate computing, networking, and physical proce uh, processes. So, as you can uh, see on the right hand side of the slide, some uh, examples include the EV charging stations. Uh, just a second. Yeah. So some uh, examples include the EV charging stations, the smart grids, the uh, DDRs, and the autonomous vehicles. And the key characteristics of these uh, cyber physical systems are real-time data processing, decision making, and sensor interactions with tight computation control integrations. So uh, just uh, giving a quick uh, ad, uh, overview of how the CPS architecture works and what could be the poten potential attack surfaces could be there. So the introduction of basically the communication network layer, which is there, uh, has created broader attack surfaces in these uh, like uh, in these side of physical system, which can be basically exploited by the attacker and these attack surfaces as you can see through the orange thunderbolts here these attack surfaces are increasing every day and can include the sophistication of cyber attacks making the traditional it cybersecurity measures very incapable of detecting these attacks uh, over the past decades, the cybersecurity issue in the cyber physical system has become very prominent uh, as uh, depicted through this uh, timeline uh, of the real world cyber attacks on the CPS. So just quickly talking about one or two of those. Uh, so in 2019, uh, in a hacking contest, some researchers hacked the Tesla Model 3, uh, basically demonstrating that uh, the serious safety concerns which could be there uh, by gaining control of the vehicle system. And in 2020, very recently during the Ukraine Russian war, a group of hackers basically displayed anti Putin messages on the charging stations across Russia, impacting the charging of the um, like uh, impacting the charging experiences and highlighting the vulnerabilities which are there in these EV infrastructure. So these basically highlight that the growing number of cyber attacks, especially in EV charging station and the plan uh, that it should uh, have to overcome these uh, and like uh, in uh, which cannot be done by the traditional IT security measures in that sense. So uh, there might be a question uh, like why basically like this talk is about on the EV charging stations and why uh, there's a need for the focus on the cybersecurity of EV charging stations. So the first would be because of the growing importance of EVCS. So uh, as we can see over the last uh, 10 years, there has been more and more electric vehicles, which basically means a greater need for a reliable and secure uh, charging infrastructure. And uh, because these EV, uh, EV charging stations are essential for shift towards the green energy and the smart grids as well. The unique challenges which these EVCS basically present, uh, these EVCS are highly connected uh, make, uh, to the like the connectivity over the internet and the Wi-Fi and everything make them really susceptible to the various cyber attacks which can happen. And they have very specific communication protocols that require the uh, security measures as well. And because the uh, EVs have uh, grown a lot and the large deployment of EVCS have taken place, so the tax surface has also increased a lot, which makes the uh, job of an attacker on an adversary very easy. So that's why we need to basically focus on the cybersecurity issue. And uh, the main third reason would be because of the privacy concerns and the, uh, like the regu uh, regulatory compliance which are there because the, a lot of raw sensitive data is passed, like the network data which is there, the payment information from your EV charging stations and some operational data that needs protection. So because of all this, there's a major, uh, uh, there should be a major focus on the cybersecurity of EV charging stations. So um, uh, talking about how an EV charging station architecture based 
hectically looks like. So there are four critical uh, actors in the EV charging station architecture. First would be the EV uh, supply equipment, which is basically the first connection point between the data exchange between your EV and the charging station. And it is uh, done by the protocol named as ISO 15118. It's a very standard protocol used throughout the world. Uh, some uh, uh, the second actor would be the charging stations. So multiple charging uh, points can ensure basically the compliance of the power limits between the ISO 15118, which is between the EVs and the EV charging stations, and the OCPP, which is between the EV charging stations and the specialized management systems, which take care of mostly the billing and other operational uh, details in that sense. The last one would be the DSO, which basically acts like a global server and basically super, uh, supervises the electric, uh, electricity distribution and grid stability uh, and basically integrating data from uh, like various charging station management systems for like enhancing the efficiency in that manner. So uh, there have been uh, like a lot of attacks which have happened on the EV charging stations which have been like exploited by the adversaries. So these are a few examples of what the attacks could be. And these are because of the extensive connectivity of the EVCS systems, which I also mentioned in the previous slides, which make them vulnerable, vulnerable to these cyber threats as adversaries exploit these systems quite a lot. So the main uh, attacks could be an, uh, like uh, which can be faced uh, by the EV charging station ecosystem could be like the DDoS attacks, which is the distributed denial of system attacks, or the man in the middle attacks, which can happen, or some kind of a data vulnerability or injection attacks, which can happen. So just giving uh, one or two examples about what these attacks basically are. So in uh, if we talk about the TCP sync flood attacks, so in an EV charging ecosystem, these basically uh, target the server managing the sessions uh, initiation between the EVs and the charging uh, units uh, in that sense, which can basically, uh, how, how they can uh, basically attack the targeted servers is, they can overwhelm the server's capacity to a very high limit to which after which it uh, can basically result in significant service disruptions or can prevent the EV charging stations from uh, starting the charging at any given point of time. The second one is uh, a OS fin fingerprinting attack. So I'm not sure like how familiarized the audience is. So I just quickly wanted to give a brief introduction about this as well. So this the over uh, the OS fingerprinting basically allows the adversaries to identify uh, the EVCS devices, operating systems targeting the known vulnerabilities, and they use techniques like uh, tools like basically Xprobe to to map out the vulnerabilities and prepare the targeted attacks. So these are all the like some of the the attacks which can happen and the adversary take a lot of time to figure what these vulnerabilities are and how can they bypass it out actually. So if we talk about the related work, just a second. So there has been some research which has been done in the EVCS security for sure, but because uh, since it's a very uh, newer uh, a newer kind of topic in the last five, four, five years, it has gained a lot of uh, interest among the researchers. So there has been a few uh, uh, papers published, few, few contributions given to the EVCS security. But the research gap we figured out was, uh, first of all, yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot more to explore in the EVCS security realm for sure. Then the data privacy issues were not unaddressed. So was not uh, addressed, and uh, the whatever work has been done on the EVCS security as of yet was done on the uh, generic IoT data sets. So basically, there needs to be some tailor data sets which were very uh, relevant and specific to some of the EVCS characteristics, if not all, and the uh, there should be some privacy pre uh, preserving solutions uh, which need to be developed to enhance the anomaly detection relevance, effectiveness, and to protect the sensitive raw information which is there among these ecosystems. So the research objective of our work was basically to develop a federated learning based anomaly detection system specifically for the EV charging ecosystem uh, using decentralized data processing to ensure that we have uh, data privacy and security in that manner and then to conduct the performance benchmarks against uh, traditional machine learning ADS models to demonstrate that how better the FL effectiveness is there in the real world uh, scenarios or not and then basically third 
third way was to utilize a EVCA specific data to enhance our model's accuracy in identifying the anomalies rather than using a IoT generated data set. So, uh, but there might be a question that why federated learning is critical for the EV charging ecosystem? Why cannot we just use a machine learning based anomaly detection system that has been used in uh, previous works as well? So, uh, it is basically a five sum of uh, like points which I can state. One is about uh, surely about the data privacy aspect because it basically ensures that uh, sensitive information basically stays local, uh, protecting the raw data which is there uh, between the EVs, EV charging stations, management system, and eventually the DSOs. Uh, then uh, for enhanced secu security, we can use federated learning because it basically reduces the risk for large scale data breaches by keeping the data decentralized at the uh, like the, at the client level itself. Then uh, resource optimization, basically utilizing the local computation resources itself and reducing the loads on the central server, which could be there because of the aggregation of the entire data. Then the scalability issue, like if we utilize the federated learning concept, it can handle the growing number of EVCS uh, without the central uh, server being overloaded too much and finally meeting the regulatory compliances of the data protection regulations which have been formulated by different organizations in that sense. So this is our uh, FL EVCS methodology, uh, which we have uh, like formulated for this particular architecture. So as you can see, the EVs are connected to an EV charging station via ISO 15118, and the EV charging stations are eventually connected to a charging station management system via the OCPP protocol. So the uh, these uh, the charging station management system basically. This architecture basically illustrates the federated learning concept which we have. And uh, like as I pointed out, these EVCS network consist of multiple charging stations and management systems which can be uh, like utilized. So each group of these charging station management system basically represent in uh, represented in a separate cluster, which we can consider as client one, can share data amongst themselves. So basically, these charging station management system can share the data with the other charging management system uh, uh, under their own vicinity, uh, which is there in this own cluster under one client uh, within uh, their cluster so that they can improve their local models in that sense. However, they do not want to share the raw sensitive data which they gave, get from these EVs to the other uh, charging station management system, which are outside their scope, basically. And that's what uh, basically uh, like motivated us, uh, this architecture to basically utilize the federated learning concept as well. So this federated learning setup basically then uh, like the charging station management system basically train their local model which is there and can pass the local model parameters which are there which like the weights and the biases which could be there to the global server like the DSO and there the federated uh, like the federated averaging or some kind of aggregation happens and then the federated model parameters are again sent back to the charging station management system and again the whole iterative process basically pans out. So, like, yeah, mostly everyone on this panel might be uh, on this, uh, like, uh, call might be aware of the federated learning process. But, yeah, for some of those who are new to this field, just giving an overview of how the federated learning process basically works. So, it starts with model initialization. The global model ways are initialized on the server and distributed to the uh, clients in this uh, setup, basically the charging station management system for the initial setup. Then uh, the local training happens, which basically states that the clients pre-processes and train their local global model using the 70% of the data set which we have. Then uh, the pa parameter sharing happens after training. Basically, the clients send their unique model parameters like the weights and the biases to the server. Uh, at the server, basically, uh, when, once these all the parameters are sent to the server, at the server itself, uh, the aggregation of these updates happen using, uh, like in our uh, work, we have utilized the federated averaging algorithm for improving the global model and even Eventually, the global model again redistributes these uh, federated averaged uh, uh, new parameters back to the uh, clients. And then this process basically re uh, repeats over a cycle until and unless the model converges. 
So for this work, we have basically utilized a, a data set named as a CIC EV SE 2024 data set. It's a very, very recently published data set uh, uh, recording some, uh, some of the cyber threats in the EV uh, CS environment with a real EV charger and uh, some Raspberry Pi. So as you can see on the right hand side, this is the setup of how a local test bed kind of a thing they have set up. They have used different Raspberry Pis and connected them via different protocols which are very relevant to the uh, real EV ecosystem and uh, then they have basically um, like uh, form uh, like formulated many attacks so that they can uh, gather this whole information. Uh, so in this data set, basically there are 31 CSV uh, uh, files uh, which basically have benign and malicious attacks like the flooding attack, the DOS attacks and the SQL injection attacks uh, on the interfaces of the EV SE which are basically analyzed via the NF stream and the Python scripts. So uh, just uh, quickly, briefly going through uh, how the uh, we, how what we did after getting the data set. So we performed uh, some pre-processing techniques on the of the data and the features. So it basically uh, started out with uh, labeling all the records which are there into one CSV file because uh, initially we had thirty one CSV files, so we had to merge them into one CSV file and then cleansing the data by removing some corrupted records or any records. Next, we basically uh, remove the less correlated features which are there and then converted the cater uh, ca categorical variable into the dummy indicator arrays uh, for better uh, use case. And then finally, we uh, use the feature normalization technique followed by SMOT uh, implementation for balancing. SMOT is basically a synthetic minor minority over sampling technique. It's a very well-known technique which is utilized in the data pre-processing part. So at the bottom, uh, right, you can see some of the data uh, set features which are there. So it's a very big data set, uh, almost around like 85 features or, or, or something like that. So I'm just uh, like putting out some of the features which are there. So some of the relevant features which you can see would be like the protocol, which kind of protocol is be being utilized between the, this communication, what is the length of the packet which is being sent out, what's the station ID, what's the session ID, what's the information which is actually, actually being piped. Uh, uh, like passed out. So these are some of the features which uh, are very relevant to the EVCS and not very generic in the IoT uh, like realm itself. So that's why this data set was uh, like uh, is being utilized nowadays for the EVCS uh, anomaly detection purpose for sure. So in our feature extraction process, initially we had like 86 uh, ITOT based features. So by ITOT, I mean like information technology. Uh, so basically the features which are related to the network and data communication and OT features, meaning the operational technology feature, which are that involve the monitoring and control of physical devices and process in the industrial environments. So uh, because we had like 86 ITOT based features, so we thought that maybe we can reduce some of the features because some of the features might not be highly correlated. Uh, so for that, we uh, utilize the dimensionality feature reduction techniques. So for, the, uh, for our work, we basically utilize two major techniques, uh, which are principal component analysis and information gain technique. So the PCA basically reduces the dimensionality by transforming the features into uncorrelated principal components. And uh, the information gain technique is a very like relevant technique and basically measures the uh, most relevant features by elevating the information uh, again, uh, uh, concerning the target variable which is there. So after performing these two techniques, uh, out of these 86, we eventually got 57 uh, selected features. So as you can see on the right hand side, this is the heat correlation map. So they, these are the 57 features which, which were then eventually utilized in our model on the client's uh, localized uh, neural networks as well. So for the model evaluation part, uh, we basically uh, like uh, did a baseline ML ADS model uh, like check. So for that, we basically collected the raw uh, traffic data, which is directly uh, from the individual charging station management sy systems, and then trained e uh, all the local uh, trained them on the local DNN model itself without the federated learning concept to have it as a baseline model on a 70-30 trained uh, tested data, and then employ techniques like uh, uh, came uh, like 
uh, uh, nearest neighbor uh, support vector machine random forest and new, uh, just plain neural networks itself. And for our federated learning EVCS model, we basically uh, like uh, what I stated in the previous slides as well about the federated learning model, uh, how it basically performs. So for that, uh, but the problem which we faced uh, one was the because we had we did not have a like a in a uh, raw stream of data coming rather than we had a uh, like we had one um, you know, big uh, uh, um, like csv file in which all the data was there and we wanted our uh, uh, all the clients to basically think that every time uh, they run around it uh, comes out to be a new kind of data so for that we basically uh, like for each of the charging station management system which were the clients so we divided the 70 percent of the training data into 40 equal parts to fit the federated learning iterative nature basically allowing for repeated training with uh like not exactly new, but somewhat new subset in each cycle among the five clients which we had in our model. And these basically utilize a deep neural network with four hidden layers optimized with Adam optimizer and learning rate of 0 0.01. And then eventually it was tested on 30% of the training data post convergence. And for our model, we basically utilize two of the matrices, uh, the accuracy and F1 score. These are very standard matrices which have been utilized in a um, uh, lot of uh, machine learning and omni detection systems as well. So uh, just uh, I, I just wanted to emphasize uh, like why we basically utilize flower framework for this and not like some IBM uh, framework or some of the other like relevant frameworks which are there. So the main reason was when I started to basically work in this area. So it was very new to me and I just started like uh, maybe a few months back, I just started to work on this. So it was very uh, new to me and I wanted to learn a lot uh, as well. So I figured out that flower basically is uh, something which I can definitely use out because of its compatibility with different uh, ML frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch, Keras, that was really relevant for our machine learning algorithms as well. And then it support a lot of customization and extension that how I can utilize some of the customization aspect, uh, like uh, customizing my code in that sense, however I want to frame it out. So that was very uh, essential for uh, my work uh, as a new uh, uh, person working in the in this federated learning environment. Then um, it can uh, like basically uh, deploy large scale deployments as well. So uh, that is very suitable for a complex environment like a EV charging station, and then it can have handle uh, robust communications. And then uh, the other uh, good uh, thing was like it's a very growing community, the flower community, and has a very good contributor base. So as uh, the previous presenter also stated that he will definitely put that out in Slack channel and everything. So that basically helps the user community as well to learn from it and basically utilize them in uh, in your work going forward as well. And there were a lot of extensive documentation and tutorials which were available, which really helped me out to figure out what this federated learning concept is and how I can utilize that out. So that was uh, like a thumbs up and shout out from, uh, from our end definitely to the flower uh, labs and the community in that sense for sure. So if uh, I have to talk about the last part of the presentation about the performance evaluation. So for uh, that, our model was trained and tested on system of Intel, R, uh, uh, Intel Core i7-8500 pro uh, pro uh, processor and with a 16 GB of RAM. And for our model, we basically utilize Python, SKIT Learn, and Flower Framework, which is about, uh, uh, on the back end of the TensorFlow. And for our neural network, uh, basically neural networks layers, which are utilized in the client model. So for that, we basically utilize 60 40 40 and 20 neurons in uh, all, uh in the four hidden layers which we had with a relu activation function and a sigmoid uh, uh function for the output layer because we went for the binary classification as of yet uh, not the multi-class classification so as you can see on the right uh, on the left hand side the uh, baseline machine learning model how it performed on this particular data set so uh, the accuracy best accuracy was achieved for the neural networks uh, just the simple neural networks so it was around like 92 percent with an f1 score of uh, almost around 0 0.923 
But for our FL EVCS model, on the first round, uh, we basically got an accuracy because the first round can be considered as just the neural networks because no sharing of data or anything has happened as of yet. So it uh, almost achieved what we achieved in the normal baseline model as well, around 92% on an average across all five clients. But when it but when we went to uh, round by round and uh, the 10th round where our model basically converged out, so we achieved an accuracy of almost around 90 seven uh, percent on an average so that really and, uh, and a very good high f1 score as well as compared to the baseline models so that basically showcased that how uh, the sharing of the data amongst the various clients helped uh, each client to basically improve their accuracy and f1 score going forward uh, in the training uh, and the testing process so this basically showcases what uh, the uh, table uh, already shows. So basically, as we can see, the baseline model showcased for the neural networks and the other machine learning algorithm showcased around like 90, 92% on the best. But for the federated learning uh, on an average on the 10th round eventually showcased around like 97%, almost around 97%. And similarly, the F1 score was also like around 974 uh, on average. So basically indicating the superior performance which it had and the robustness across all the clients all the five clients which it could perform so yeah that was uh, what our work is and like just giving a summary of what it is so we wanted to develop a federated learning anomaly detection system using specific evcs data set to enhance the anomaly detection system in these ecosystem we come well, we demonstrated high effectiveness of our model in with an accuracy of almost around 97 percent and superior reference scores across all the clients as compared to traditional machine learning ads models uh the future work we, which we basically want to do is like expand the classification capabilities from right now because it's just binary whether attack or non-attack so we want to do it uh, convert it to a multi-class classification as well so that it can yield more detailed insights into various types of cyber attack and we want to explore the vertical federated learning aspect as well and surely now after the earlier presenter talked about the trace fl thing that is definitely on my mind which i definitely want to pursue out and figure out which is the clients which basically uh like providing the best uh of the uh like model parameters and helping out in that sense so these are some of the references uh which we uh utilize in this presentation and uh yeah really appreciate your time thank you so much to flower labs to giving us this opportunity and if you have any questions you can reach out to us and this work was recently like last week only i uh, like uh, presented in uh, the ICCN uh, 2024 conference so it might be uh, like if anyone wants to uh, look at the paper so it might be uh, available on IEEE explorer in like a few weeks or so so yeah i mean cool i think uh, thank you very much for the talk i think it was super interesting i haven't used myself at EV charging station. So it wasn't really, I never even thought that they could be hacked, but it makes total sense to build a tool that build a framework that can detect when these things happen. So I have, yeah. a, I think we are a bit over time. So I have three questions in the meantime. If anyone okay. in the audience has a, has a question, feel free to share it on the chat. Otherwise I would be the only one asking questions, but but please uh, come up with a question. I think there are many interesting things in these slides. So one of the questions I have, which I think you just answered at the end is that the model is only is detecting whether something is malicious or not. It's not detecting what type of attack that, that will be part of the future work. That's what you. Yeah, yeah. So right now, good. basically, it's just uh, uh, like stating out whether like because it has been uh, the data set has labels whether what kind of attack is right now whether it's an attack or it's include the multi-class classification to basically go go deep dive into what kind of attacks can happen and then basically utilizing something like a trace fl to indicate uh, basically trace back to which of these attacks are being transferred from which of the particular clients uh in in, in that aspect as well so we definitely want to uh work under that perspective makes sense uh, another question, I have a question kind of related to the data set. Uh, so how big is the data set? Uh, I presume the data set you were mentioning only contains malicious data or does it also contain benign totally? No, it's, it can, yeah, it contains benign 
and malicious data um like both the data uh and like has different uh, kind of like attacks as well in that but uh yeah i'm not sure about the exact uh like amount of data which is there because it was a huge data set all these 31 csv files which were there so these were taken at different point of time and uh like the data was collected at different point of time so i'm not exactly sure what's the like data length in that sense but uh yeah it's a very big data set because when we combined it to formulate one big csv it, it took like it took a lot of time first of all and then the training and the uh like testing process as well so yeah yeah i'm mostly mostly asking because especially for binary classification i think a setting like this where you have b9 and not b9 you really want to be sure that because the majority of the time there will be only b9 queries you want to be sure yeah that yeah you have more yeah, so b9 so you don't have a you know 50 50 chance so. But yeah, but, uh, so uh, that definitely was uh, like something which we considered. So there was not biasness in the data set for sure. Right. So it was almost around like 35, 40% of the benign data and the other was like the, uh, the 35, 40% of the attack data and the other was like the benign data, which is like right. suitable for any anomaly detection system in that. And so, yeah, that was the new case which we performed out. Okay. Another small question, well, two connected questions about the data set. Um, so for you, every every FL client is one of charging station, even though the charging station might have multiple of these terminals. Uh, how many how many clients, how many charging stations did you consider? Like 10, so, maybe 100, or do, do were they all involved in every round, or they were doing partial participation? Can you share a bit of some of the details regarding this or yeah, how so you partition the data? Yeah, sure. So for this uh, work, we basically had five clients in which, uh, like, the clients were basically the charging station management system, mm -hmm. and these charging station management systems were connected with the charging stations, basically. So for our work, we basically focus on the charging stations individually. There could be multiple charging stations which can be sending the information for. But for this data set, uh, as we uh, as we see here, there is uh, like uh, two charging stations which are basically like contributing to the charging station management system eventually. So, but yeah, we can definitely like when we have a test bed or a setup like this we can have multiple charging stations basically sending their data to a charging station management system and then from each of these charging station management system it will be eventually transferred to the uh date uh distributed server operator in that sense okay, cool interesting yeah yeah maybe you want to take a look at flower data sets because for example if you have just a big yeah. csv you can you can very silly i think that's something maybe following what uh Waris was mentioning at the end you could very silly uh, kind of like a pass it to a sure. partition in our data set, and you can partition it into as many as you want, following any mm -hmm. kind of mechanism. So that's quite powerful. Maybe you want to take a look for the follow up sure. work. And then my final question, and I think with this, I don't see other questions, so we'll be ending it. Is in the results, you are showing something you are calling the baseline result. Is this baseline result? centralized training with all the data or is only the training of what one uh, charging station on its own with its own data can no with all this 70 percent data of the entire uh, 100 percent data set so uh, okay. that's why we considered it because in our fl model also when we uh like uh for all the five five clients we have had a uh, like in the code, we had a uh, black set only, and then only 70% of that data set is being utilized in that. But the entire data set is be, uh, like entire 70% of the data set is being utilized for the testing purpose, and then eventually the 30, remaining 30% for the training uh, work. I mean, I was a bit surprised to see that the baseline that has access to all the training data does worse than it felt. I think a very good setup is when both are the same, but usually yeah. centralized training. If you implement both, if both have this access to the same amount of data overall, I think centralized training should be able to do. Should be able to, yeah. That, that's what we also wanted to figure out. But yeah, eventually the results show, showcase that. So okay. yeah, we, yeah the, that was the thing. But yeah, we will definitely, um, like, yeah, that we had in the mind. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's just a matter of, uh, you know, shuffling sure. the data differently or things like that. So yeah. But okay, 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 it's cool. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, 
feel free to reach out to well both of our speakers if you have any more questions. I will be just wrapping up today's Flower Monthly with this final slide, which as usual, it sets the date for the next Flower Monthly, which will be the first Wednesday of the next month, which will be in this case, 4th of September. We are cooking a lot of new things in flowers, so stay tuned for the updates as usual. And for sure, we get another run of uh, amazing speakers that have been building something uh, truly interesting with with flower or FL technologies in general. So thank you very much. If you have any questions for me about today's event or to any of our speakers, uh, feel free to ask them in the Flower Monthly Slack channel or maybe directly in the questions channel on Slack. So uh, just to finish, thank you again, our speakers. I think it was super interesting today. So thank you very much and see you in the next Flower Monthly. Yeah, thank you so much, thank uh, you so much. Guys, for giving this opportunity yeah. and thank you so much, uh, Varys, as well, for presenting your work. Yeah. Uh, you too. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Javier. Yeah.